In this lecture, I will introduce you to the basics of experimental design, statistics, and sample size determination. I will focus primarily on animal experiments for basic research, as opposed to industry or regulation, and I'll be presenting only the basic concepts with little or no details. The first part is on experimental design. Here I list the basic principles of experimental design. The key principle is that one should formulate a question or goal in advance of the experiment. The worst thing to do is to get to the end of the experiment and ask, what can I learn from these data? Note, however, that it is reasonable to get to the end of the experiment and ask, what else can I learn from these data? A good experiment is designed with a particular goal in mind. The other principles include comparison and control, replication, randomization, stratification, and factorial experiments. I'll go through each of these one at a time. I'll use this simple example throughout the lecture. We have a particular question we wish to answer. Does adding salt to drinking water affect the blood pressure of mice? Our experiment will be to provide a mouse with water containing 1% salt, wait 14 days, and then measure its blood pressure. Again, the key principle here is that we have an explicit question, and we design our experiment to answer that question. The second principle of experimental design is comparison or control. Good experiments are comparative. We should compare the blood pressure of mice-fed salt water to the blood pressure of mice-fed plain water. Or, we compare the blood pressure of strain A mice-fed salt water to strain B mice-fed salt water. Ideally, we compare concurrent controls rather than historical controls. That is, we don't compare the blood pressure of mice-fed salt water today to the blood pressure of mice-fed plain water last year. Rather, we should study both treatment groups simultaneously. One can sometimes use historical controls successfully, but the experiment will not be as good as it would have been had one used side-by-side -side comparisons, because something may have changed from last year to this year other than just the salt in the water. The third principle is replication. In the panel on the left, we have the blood pressure of one mouse fed plain water and one mouse fed salt water. In the panel on the right, we have the blood pressure for 10 mice fed plain water and 10 mice fed salt water. As I'll explain, the experiment on the right is considerably better. Why replicate? Why is the experiment with 10 mice per group better than that with one mouse per group? First, by measuring the blood pressure on several mice, we get a more precise estimate of the effect of salt water on blood pressure. We reduce the effect of uncontrolled variation. The more mice we consider, the better our estimate of the average blood pressure in each group and of the difference between these averages, the treatment effect. But even more importantly, it is only through replication that we are able to quantify our uncertainty in the response to salt water. So one reason for replication is that, by considering 10 mice per group, we get a more precise estimate of the response to salt water. But even more importantly, without looking at multiple mice per group, we have no idea how good that estimate is. A related point, an estimate on its own is of absolutely no value whatsoever without some statement of our uncertainty in that estimate. The fourth principle is randomization. We have a number of experimental subjects and a couple of different treatment groups. The experimental subjects should be assigned to the treatment groups at random. And when I say at random, I do not mean haphazardly. Rather, I mean that one should use explicit randomization, either with a computer or with something like coins, dice, or cards. Why randomize? Principally, to avoid bias. If the first six mice we grab from the cage, we assign to the treatment group, and the next six we assign to the control group, this may bias our estimate of the treatment effect, as the first six mice may have intrinsically higher blood pressure. A second, more subtle reason to randomize is that through explicit randomization, we control the role of chance in the experiment, which puts the later statistical analysis on a more solid foundation. I'm sure this last bit is more interest to me as a statistician than to you as an experimenter, but I can't avoid mentioning it, which is part of why this lecture is so long. 
fifth principle is stratification. Suppose that some of the blood pressure measurements would be made in the morning and some in the afternoon. If we anticipate that there may be some difference between morning and afternoon measurements, we would want to ensure that within each time period, there were equal numbers of individuals from each treatment group. This is sometimes called blocking due to its origins in agricultural experiments. To illustrate stratification, we'll look at another example. Imagine we are going to perform an experiment with 20 male mice and 20 female mice. Half will be given some treatments and the other half will be left untreated. And we can work with only four mice per day. The question is, how do we assign individuals to treatment groups and to days? Here's an extremely bad design. Each column here is a day. There are four mice per day. The pink squares are female mice. The blue squares are male mice. And the squares of the T indicate that we're treating the mouse, while the C indicates the mouse is in the control group. In this experiment, the female mice are the control group, and the male mice are the treatment group. Also, all of the control mice are studied in week one, while all of the treated mice are studied in week two. This is a really bad idea, since we won't be able to distinguish a sex difference in response from a treatment effect. Also, if there's a difference in results one week to the next, if there's any drift in response across the course of the experiment, it will bias our estimate of the treatment effect. This is an improved design in which individuals are assigned to treatment groups and to days completely at random. However, if we look closely, we can see some days in which there are only male mice, and some days which have only female mice. Also, if you look even more closely, more of the mice from the treatment group are studied in week one, and more of the mice from the control group are studied in week two. So a disadvantage of this design is that we leave it completely up to chance how many individuals in a particular day are treated versus not, and how many of the male mice are treated versus not. And so we are led to this concept of stratification. In this design, each day, there are two male mice, one treated and one not, and two female mice, one treated and one not. It is only the particular individuals in the particular order that they are considered that is randomized. The key here is that if there's any variation between males and females, or across the course of the experiment, we can account for that and even learn about it. This will give us more precise results, and so we may be able to get by with fewer animals. Let's summarize the two concepts of randomization and stratification. If we want to, and we're able to, we can fix a variable. For example, we can study only eight-week-old male mice from a single strain. The advantage of this is that there will be less uncontrolled variation and so we'll be able to obtain more precise results and get by with fewer mice. The disadvantage is that we will learn less. We learn only about eight-week-old male mice from this particular strain. If we don't fix a particular variable, and it may be associated with the response, it's best to stratify on that variable. So we might consider both eight-week and 12-week-old male mice from a particular strain, but stratify with respect to age, that is, we ensure that within each age group, there are equal numbers of individuals in each treatment group. For all of the things that we neither fix nor stratify, we want to randomize. We use randomization to ensure balance and thus avoid bias with respect to all of those other things. Our last major principle is that of factorial experiments. Suppose we are interested in learning about both the effects of salt water and of high fat diet on blood pressure. Ideally, we would look at all four possible treatments in one experiment. That is, we would look at each of plain water with a normal diet, plain water with a high fat diet, salt water with a normal diet, and salt water with a high fat diet. This is called a factorial experiment. There are two reasons to prefer such a super experiment rather than doing a pair of experiments, one looking at salt and one looking at fat. First, we can learn more. And second, we can actually get more precise results from the factorial experiment. This is an example to illustrate what more we can learn from this kind of factorial experiment. Whether salt water and dietary fat show an interaction in their effect on blood pressure.
In the left panel, salt and fat do not interact. This is the average blood pressure for mice fed plain water and given a normal diet. And here is the average blood pressure for mice fed salt water on a normal diet. And so the difference is the effect of salt in the case of a normal diet. And this is the average blood pressure for mice fed plain water on a high fat diet. And here is the average blood pressure for mice fed salt water on a high fat diet. And so this difference is the effect of salt in the case of a high fat diet. And so in this case, the effect of salt on blood pressure is the same in the case of a normal diet as in the case of a high fat diet. Similarly, the effect of dietary fat is the same in the case of plain water as in the case of salt water. So in this case we say their effects are additive. In the right panel, the effect of salt is greater in the case of a high fat diet than in the case of a normal diet. And similarly, the effect of dietary fat is greater in the case of salt water than in the case of plain water. Here we say that dietary fat and salt water interact. My point here is that we can learn about such interactions only by performing this sort of factorial experiment, studying all four treatments in one experiment. I want to add just a few extra points. First, measurements can be influenced by unconscious biases, so it's best to make such measurements without knowledge of the treatment group. This is called blinding. Second, it can sometimes be useful to use the subjects themselves as their own controls, so-called internal controls. For example, we could compare the blood pressure of a mouse before being fed salt water to its blood pressure after being fed salt water. It is with non-invasive procedures that we can make best use of this sort of internal control. One may still want to use some regular controls in order to protect against the possibility that everyone's blood pressure goes up from one month to the next. Finally, representativeness, a word that I may have just made up. You should always ask whether the subjects or tissues you are studying are really representative of the population you want to study. For example, if you get a set of cancer tissues from patients at Johns Hopkins, it may be questionable whether they are representative of all possible such cancer tissues, or whether there may be something special about cancer tissue samples from Hopkins. Ideally, the material is a random sample from the population of interest. To summarize this section on experimental design, a good experiment should be unbiased, have high precision, be simple in order to avoid mistakes, have a wide range of applicability, and you should be able to quantify the uncertainty in your results. Replication helps you to increase precision and quantify uncertainty. Randomization keeps things unbiased and is necessary for quantifying uncertainty. Stratification helps to increase precision and increase the range of applicability. Some things are somewhat opposed with one another. For example, blinding helps to avoid bias, but also makes the experiment less simple and can lead to mistakes. Using more uniform material, such as considering only male mice, helps to increase precision, but reduces the range of applicability. If you want a broad range of applicability, you need to deliberately vary things. In this section, I'll discuss the basics of statistics. First, what is statistics? This quote from R.A. Fisher is my favorite sentence and is the perfect answer to that question. We may at once admit that any inference from the particular to the general must be attended with some degree of uncertainty, but this is not the same as to admit that such inference cannot be absolutely rigorous, for the nature and degree of the uncertainty may itself be capable of rigorous expression. The point is, science is about making general statements on the basis of particular data. Such inductive inference is inherently uncertain, and the aim of statistics is to quantify that uncertainty. In particular, statistics concerns the exploration and analysis of data and uses probability theory to do inductive inference. Particularly, it uses probability theory to quantify the uncertainty in inductive inference.
We start with an example. Imagine we have the blood pressure of six mice. We're not interested in these six particular mice. Rather, we want to make some statement about the blood pressure of all possible such mice. The way statisticians think about this is through sampling. We imagine, here on the left, the distribution of the blood pressure of all possible mice. We're particularly interested in the average blood pressure of all possible mice. But we don't see this whole distribution. Instead, we observe six draws from this distribution, the blood pressure of our particular six mice. Those six mice have their own average blood pressure. And on the basis of those six mice and their average blood pressure, we want to make some statement about what is going on behind the scenes. What could the true underlying average reasonably be? The key idea is to think about what other samples might have been obtained. On the right, we have several possible samples of six mice. The one in the middle is our observed sample, but a number of other possible samples could have been obtained. Each of those samples of six mice has a different average blood pressure. This leads us to think about the distribution of the sample average. On the left is the distribution of blood pressure in all possible mice. It tells us what the blood pressure of a single random mouse would look like. On the right is the distribution of the average blood pressure for a sample of six mice. It tells us what sort of number we will obtain if we take a random sample of six mice and then calculate their average blood pressure. They are both centered around the true average but the distribution of the sample average on the right is more tightly concentrated around the true average. If we had even more than six mice, the distribution of the sample average would be even more tightly concentrated around the true average. We don't actually get to see either of these distributions. We just see the blood pressure for our six random mice. But if we understand the connection between the underlying distribution and the distribution of the sample average, we can use our six blood pressures to make inference about the underlying truth, and just as importantly, to quantify our uncertainty in that inference. The first important statistical object we'll discuss is the confidence interval. Suppose we observe six mice with an average blood pressure of 103.6 and a standard deviation of 9.7. The SD is a measure of how variable the blood pressures were. We'll assume that the underlying population follows a normal distribution, the so-called bell-shaped curve. Then, on the basis of these data, we calculate a 95% confidence interval for the underlying average blood pressure as the interval from 93.4 to 113.8. I won't explain how it's calculated. What does this confidence interval mean? The best way to view it is as the set of plausible values for the underlying true average blood pressure. That is, given these data, the confidence interval indicates what we believe to be the reasonable values for the true average blood pressure. Another way to view it is that, in advance, we had a 95% chance of obtaining an interval that contained the true average. Let me explain with a picture. This is a set of 100 possible confidence intervals. The one on the far left, in red, is our confidence interval the one we calculated with our particular six mice. But we might have obtained a different set of six mice, which would lead us to a different confidence interval. So these are a hundred possible confidence intervals, each based on a different set of six random mice. Most of them contain the true population average, but about five percent of them in green do not contain the true average. But we're only going to see one sample and one confidence interval and we're not going to know whether our interval contains the true average or not. But we can say our confidence interval indicates the plausible values for the true average, keeping in mind that in advance we had a 95% chance of getting an interval that really did contain the true average, and a 5% chance of getting an interval that didn't. We're not so interested in the average blood pressure of mice. What we're really interested in is the effect of salt water on blood pressure. That is, how much higher is the average blood pressure of mice-fed salt water compared to the average blood pressure of mice-fed plain water? So we think, behind the scenes we have these two different distributions, 
the distribution of blood pressures for mice fed plain water and that for mice fed salt water. And then we measure the blood pressure for six mice from each group, the data on the right. And we want, on the basis of these data, to make inference about what was going on behind the scenes over on the left. And so just as we can get a confidence interval for average blood pressure, we can also get a confidence interval for the treatment effect. While I again won't explain how to do it, on the basis of these data, we obtain a 95% confidence interval of 12.6 plus or minus 11.5. And so on the basis of these data on 12 mice, six of which we fed plain water and six we fed salt water, these are the plausible values for the difference between the true underlying population averages. This leads us to the next statistical object, significance tests. The confidence interval indicates the plausible values for the effect of salt water on blood pressure. A test of statistical significance seeks to answer the question, does salt water have an effect on blood pressure? Yes or no? We think about two hypotheses. The null hypothesis, that salt water has no effect on blood pressure, and the alternative hypothesis, that salt water does have an effect. We're seeking to prove the alternative hypothesis. In answering this yes or no question, there are two possible errors that we can make. We attach both names and numbers to them. The type 1 error, or false positive, is to conclude that salt water has an effect when in fact it does not have an effect. The type 2 error, or false negative, is to fail to demonstrate that salt water has an effect when it really does have an effect. We set things up so that the type 1 error is the worst of the two errors, but they are both errors. It may help to consider this table. The truth may be either that salt water has no effect or that it does have an effect. And there are two possible conclusions that we can make. One is to reject the null hypothesis, that salt water has no effect, or we can fail to reject the null hypothesis. Anyway, if the truth is that there's no effect and we reject the null hypothesis, we've made a type 1 error. If the truth is that there's no effect and we fail to reject the null hypothesis, we're happy. If the truth is that there is an effect and if we reject the null hypothesis, we're also happy. And if the truth is that there is an effect, but we fail to reject the null hypothesis, we've made a type 2 error. To actually conduct a significance test, we calculate some test statistic using the data. For example, we look at the difference between the average blood pressure for our six mice that we fed salt water and that for our six mice we fed plain water. We'll call this difference D. If D is large, we lean towards saying that salt water has an effect. The question is, how large is large? How different do our observed groups need to be for us to conclude that salt water really does have an effect? The answer is to compare our observed D statistic to its distribution if the treatment had no effect. Still more jargon. We are seeking to control the rate of type 1 errors. A type 1 error is a false positive to conclude that the treatment has an effect when in fact it doesn't. The significance level is the chance that we reject the null hypothesis if the null hypothesis is true. This is the rate of type 1 errors, usually denoted alpha and usually set at 5%. We then find a critical value C where we'll reject the null hypothesis if our statistic D is greater in absolute value than C. We choose C so that if the null hypothesis is true, that is, if the treatment has no effect, the chance of obtaining a D that is greater in absolute value than C is at our chosen rate alpha. A few pictures may make this more clear. Imagine the case that salt water has no effect on blood pressure then the distribution of blood pressure in mice-fed salt water would be exactly the same as the distribution of blood pressure in mice-fed plain water.
and we can use that to figure out what the distribution of the difference between the two group averages would be. Again, if salt water has no effect and with six mice in each group. That's going to be centered around zero. We choose the critical value so that the area to the right of C and to the left of minus C is 5%. Now if salt does have an effect on blood pressure, we'll see a shift in the blood pressure distribution in the salt water mice relative to the plain water mice. And this will lead to a shift in the distribution of the possible differences that we'll see. And so the dashed curve is the distribution of the difference between two groups if salt water has no effect, while the solid curve is the distribution of the difference between the group averages if the true effect is as we see over here on the left. And so if salt does have an effect, most of the time we're going to obtain a difference between the group averages that is bigger than the critical value C, and we'll be able to come to the happy conclusion that salt does have an effect on blood pressure. So finally, one last statistical object, though this is not the last bit of jargon, unfortunately. The p-value. The p-value is the probability of obtaining data as extreme as you had observed if the null hypothesis had been true. That is, you look at the data and ask, what would be the chance of obtaining such data if salt water had no effect? A small p-value indicates that it would be unlikely to obtain data like yours if there were no treatment effect. And so it leads you to the conclusion that there is a treatment effect. In particular, if your p-value is smaller than your chosen significance level, alpha, you would reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there is a treatment effect. As we're seeking to prove that the treatment has an effect, small p-values are good. Keep in mind, a p-value is not the probability that salt water has no effect. Rather, it is the probability of obtaining data as extreme as yours if salt water had no effect. This is a somewhat subtle distinction, but it is an important distinction, at least to me. In summary, I've introduced a lot of new jargon and discussed three important statistical objects. A confidence interval indicates the plausible values for a true population average or treatment effect, given the observed data. A significance test uses the observed data to answer a yes or no question, such as, does the treatment have an effect? And a p-value summarizes the result of a significance test. A small p-value leads you to conclude that there is an effect. Finally, never cite a p-value without a confidence interval. I can't move on without saying a few words about data presentation. The picture on the right is a bad plot. The picture on the left is a good plot. The picture on the right is bad because, first of all, it gives you very little information. It summarizes all of the data as just two numbers. Second, it uses a completely gratuitous three-dimensional rendering of those two numbers. The picture on the left is good, or at least better, because it not only shows the two group averages, but also gives a sense of our uncertainty, and even displays the actual data points. With only six individuals per group, it is a shame not to show the actual data, as they take up no more space than the bad plot on the right. The table on the right is a bad table. The table on the left is a good table. The table on the right is bad because it contains far too many digits, and because ending zeros were omitted. If the 65 is meaningful here, then there should be a couple of zeros here. The SEM in parentheses is the standard error of the mean and indicates our uncertainty in our estimate of the true mean. With an SEM like 0.63, the last three digits here are indicated to be complete noise and might as well be omitted. The good table on the left has about half as many digits but all of the content 
of the bad table on the right. We've reached the final section on sample size determination. I'm going to be a bit more sketchy in this section. I can't help myself from starting with this fundamental formula. To determine the appropriate sample size, take how much money you have available, divided by the cost per subject. Of course, I can't get by with this formula in a series of lectures on improving animal research. And so, listen to the IACUC. If you use too few animals in your study, it will be a complete waste, as you will have learned nothing. If you use too many animals, it will be a partial waste, as you will have learned something, but you could have gotten by with fewer animals. It seems clear that using too few animals is far worse than using too many. However, it is also clear that identifying the appropriate number of animals is a laudable goal. You will achieve the aims of your experiment with the minimal use of animals. Let's quickly summarize this whole business of statistical tests. We're going to compare the blood pressure of six mice fed salt water with that of six mice fed plain water. Let delta denote the true difference between the two underlying averages, the so-called treatment effect. Our null hypothesis is that delta is equal to zero, that there is no treatment effect. We have some test statistic D, and we reject the null hypothesis if the absolute value of D is greater than some critical value C. And that critical value C is chosen so that if the null hypothesis were true, if there were no treatment effect, the chance that we would reject the null and falsely conclude that the treatment did have an effect would be controlled at 5%. One last bit of jargon, power. Power is the chance that we will reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. That is, that you could correctly conclude that the treatment has an effect when it really does have an effect. In other words, it is the chance you will have a happy conclusion when you should have a happy conclusion. In the figure, the white distribution on the left is the null distribution of our statistic. It is the distribution of D if the treatment has no effect. We use that distribution to choose the critical value C, so that we reject the null hypothesis if we get a statistic that is either bigger than C or less than minus C. The yellow distribution is the distribution of D when the treatment really does have an effect, and in particular when its effect is 8.5. The power is the chance that, if the treatment truly has an effect 8.5, we obtain a statistic that is greater than C. And so it is the area under the yellow curve that is to the right of C. In this particular case, the power turns out to be 70%. Power depends on the particular design of your experiment, the particular method for analyzing the data, the size of the underlying treatment effect, the variability in the measurements within each treatment group, the chosen significance level, and the sample size. Of course, usually, we try to determine the sample size to give a particular power. And just as people generally use a significance level of 5%, people generally seek the sample size that gives 80% power. This is to illustrate the effect of the sample size on power. The top panel is for the case of six mice in each treatment group. The bottom panel is for the case of 12 mice per group. In moving from six to 12, the distributions become more tightly concentrated around their means. Above, the white distribution is for the case that the treatment has no effect and that there are six mice in each group. In moving to the case of 12 mice per group, the distribution is still centered around zero, but is more tightly concentrated around zero. And so the critical value C moves from around 7 to just under 5. The yellow distribution above is for the case that the treatment has effect 8.5 and that there are 6 mice in each treatment group. In moving to 12 mice per group, the distribution remains centered around 8.5, but again becomes more tightly concentrated. The power is the area under the yellow curve that is to the right of the critical value C. In moving from 6 mice per group to 12 mice per group, the power increases from 70% to 94% because the critical value has moved to the left and because the yellow distribution has become more concentrated. We now look at how the size of the treatment effect affects the power. Above, the treatment effect is 8.5. Below, the treatment effect is 
In both cases, there are six mice in each treatment group. All that changes here is that the yellow distribution shifts from having a center around 8.5 to having a center around 12.5. The critical value stays the same, but the area under the yellow curve that is to the right of the critical value increases from 70% to 96%. It seems pretty useless to give any formulas, as every experimental design and every statistical method requires its own formula, it's best for us to just focus on the major concepts. Instead, let's look at the effects of various things in the required sample size. First, if you desire greater power, a greater chance of receiving a happy result, you will need a larger sample size. If you wish to use a more stringent statistical test, for example, controlling the rate of false positives at 1% rather than 5%, you will also need a larger sample size. On the other hand, if you're able to decrease the measurement variability, you could get by with a smaller sample size. And if you're able to increase the treatment effect, perhaps by using a greater concentration of salt, you can get by with a smaller sample size. To determine the minimal sample size, you need to know the following. First, the exact experimental design and method of statistical analysis. Next, the chosen significance level, usually 5%, and the desired power, usually 80%. Most importantly, you need some understanding of the variability in the measurements. If necessary, you should perform a pilot study. Alternatively, you may use data from prior experiments. Finally, you need to identify the smallest effect that you would consider meaningful. To reduce the required sample size, you may reduce the number of treatment groups being compared. For example, rather than comparing the response in five inbred strains, you might focus on just two strains. Of course, you will learn less about the world with fewer treatment groups. Secondly, you may find a more precise measurement. For example, you might consider the average time to some effect rather than the proportion of individuals that are sick. Finally, you may decrease the variability in the measurements, either by making the subjects more homogeneous, for example, by using an inbred strain focusing only on male mice and having all the mice of the same age, by using stratification, you could stratify on sex, age, cage position, day, by controlling for other variables such as weight in your statistical analysis, or by averaging multiple measurements on each subject, for example, taking blood pressure every day for a week rather than just on one day. Our final conclusions. Experiments should be designed. Good design and good analysis together can lead to reduced sample sizes. And finally, it's a good idea to consult an expert on both the analysis and the design of your experiment. This is really the end. There are hundreds of books on statistical analysis and experimental design. Here I list just two. If you are interested in learning more, you may consider a course that I teach in the School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins in the spring of each year. This course is intended particularly for experimental scientists and greatly expands on the material I've covered in this lecture.